does it hurt so much to feel lonely? And what can we do about it? Scientists are giving us some exciting answers with the help of a tiny worm and a truly unpopular rodent. The worm is called C. elegans, also known as the roundworm. But who wants to say roundworm when you can say C. elegans? You can find it in your garden's compost heap, happily munching on rotting vegetables and such. The rodent is the prairie vole, an adorable little critter. You can also find it in your garden, which chances are it is cheerfully destroying. These two small creatures are helping scientists unlock the mysteries behind one of the worst afflictions a human being can have, loneliness. And make no mistake, loneliness is a big deal. It can make us sick, it can make us age faster, it can, it can even kill us. A recent study by Carla Parisinotto at UCSF showed that seniors who were lonely were more likely to get sick or to die than those with happy social lives. Loneliness can disturb our sleep. It can trigger depression. It can increase our risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. It runs rampant through society, a health crisis, an epidemic. But we tend not to talk about it because Quite often, we feel ashamed that we're lonely. We think it means that we are weak, that we're losers. But loneliness doesn't mean those things at all. What loneliness really means is that we're human. Human beings are super social. Since the very earliest hunter-gatherers, we've thrived because we like to do things together. But what happens if I wander off from my group? Suddenly, I'm more vulnerable and the group is more vulnerable as well. That's where loneliness comes to the rescue. Loneliness is a kind of pain, an emotional pain, that we can start to feel when we're separated from those we care about. It's a message from our brain telling us that we're in danger. Among early humans, the ones who felt the emotional pain of loneliness when they strayed off from the tribe were the ones most likely to live long enough to reproduce and pass along their genes. The ones who didn't get lonely, well, you know, <laughs> tiger attack. So loneliness is great, right? Well, yeah, as long as we just experience it for a short period of time, when the emotional pain is acute, the problem is when we stay lonely. When the emotional pain becomes chronic, our neural wiring is still pretty much the same as it was back when we were hunter-gatherers. It wasn't designed to deal with modern life, when families are much less likely to stay together, when modern transportation can whisk us thousands of miles away from the folks we grew up with, when technology like the internet can make us feel like we're more in touch than we really are. That's when we need to fight loneliness. And to fight it, we need to understand it, which is where our worms come in. First, let's just get one thing out of the way. Is there a way to tell if a roundworm is, is truly lonely? No, I don't think that we could say that a roundworm is lonely. It's a human construct, really, the whole idea of loneliness. But we can tell if it prefers hanging out with its fellow roundworms, dwelling, or getting away from them roaming, and we can figure out what's going on in its nervous system at all times because compared to us, C. elegans are very simple. Like humans have about 86 billion neurons, which makes things really complicated. On the other hand, C. elegans have 302. Okay, just 302 neurons, maybe 303 on a good day. So they're much easier to study. They're living, behaving animals. And even though they can't, you know, sing an opera or write a novel, they can do fairly sophisticated maneuvers like learn new memories or forage for food. They have social interactions with one another. Yet another cool thing about these worms, they're transparent. So researchers can actually see what's going on inside them. As a result of all these cool qualities, C. elegans have been crucial in the development of drugs to fight cancer and all kinds of other amazing advances, including new discoveries in the study of loneliness. When they have normal amounts of some certain chemicals, they have normal amounts of social interaction and normal amounts of time spent dwelling versus exploring. The chemicals that control that 
Serotonin is the exact same chemical in humans that regulates mood. So thanks to C. elegans, we can see a possible link between social isolation and mood disorders like depression. And what C. elegans can't tell us about loneliness, maybe prairie voles can. What makes uh, at least the voles that we study, which are prairie voles, um, exceptional is that prairie voles belong to about 4%, the population of about 4% of mammals that are socially monogamous. You have the prairie voles and they, they mate for life, like they meet early on, I assume, and I guess they would meet in a garden or something. Or, or a prairie. Or a prairie, right, prairie voles. You know, you have to wake up really early. To... <laughs> get something past me. Uh, so you have your prairie voles and, and they, they tend to mate for life. And then you have, I believe, the, the montane? Montane or meadow voles. Montane, and both of those are kinds of voles are promiscuous. Yeah, those animals tend to live more in social isolation. So they don't really stick around in the way that prairie voles do for both of them to take care of the offspring and then to sort of live in these family units. So they sort of wander off and then they've fed another female and they go on to mate with them. Just like with us humans, when prairie voles become isolated from those they care about, they can experience the pain of social loss that we call loneliness. And just like with us, the resulting stress can do serious damage, especially in the brain. What's causing all these changes? So you've probably heard of cortisol, so that is definitely a hormone that we think and we know correlates with stress in humans. The hormone version of that in voles is also something that we can look for in the blood and what's circulating in the animals when we put them under social stress. So thanks to prairie voles, researchers are learning tons about loneliness and the brain. But in order to combat the human blight of loneliness, we're also gonna have to go outside the lab. There was a terrific study in Ireland that paired isolated and lonely older adults with volunteers, who were also elderly. After a series of regular visits by these volunteers, the subjects tended to become less lonely. And as a bonus, the volunteers tended to become less lonely as well. That study's principal investigator, Dr. Brian Lawler, points out that healthcare professionals and policymakers need to make treating loneliness a priority. We know about the health risk of smoking and the health risk of being overweight. And there are public health policies about smoking and weight, obesity. But the risk of dying from loneliness and isolation is about the same as light cigarette smoking. And it's probably greater than obesity, but we don't have a public health approach or policy around loneliness. So it's not just about examining the chest or examining the heart, it's understanding the person. It's listening to the person and asking the right questions. And as I say, you know, are you lonely? Who are the most important people in your life? You, you, you learn an awful lot very quickly from those two questions. By treating everyone with kindness and consideration, even if just for a moment, we can vastly improve their quality of life and our own. Human civilizations can be beautiful, but they can truly thrive only when everyone is seen and heard, when all voices are counted. And for that to happen, no one can be left to suffer in isolation. And if we're successful in this great coming together, we'll have these wonderful researchers to thank. Along, of course, with their brilliant animal collaborators. A few things to keep in mind as we strive for a less lonely future. Loneliness is not the same thing as being alone. Someone can be quite happy while spending some alone time and also can be miserably lonely even when surrounded by others. There's always been a tension between rugged individualism and doing stuff together for the common good. Maybe it would be cool for us to lean a bit more into the doing stuff together side of things. We all get lonely now and then. It's natural, it's, it's even necessary. A reminder from generations before that we need one another. But when that loneliness lingers on and on, that's when it's time for some meaningful social contact. Though, come to think of it, I'm starting to feel kind of lonely now. I... Hey, hey, where are you going? Come back. Thanks. I just wanted us to have this little extra bit of dwelling time.